interest of time, uh, we're going to get started. I'm sure the crowd is going to grow as we um, get the proceedings uh, going on today. So for today's um, grand rounds, um, I'm just going to go ahead and uh, share the slides uh, so that uh, we can have it uh, utilized for um, CME and MOC purposes. So all the images and videos will be on the video link uh, here. And uh, for getting the CME credits, uh, you can use uh, the code 17027. Please send this as an SMS message now uh, at the number 888-816-4893 for the CME credits. And for uh, obtaining the maintenance of certification points, the room code is future45, uh, which can be used for this link to answer the questions. And if you get it correctly, you'll have it uh, directly credited to your ABM ID in the cloud CME. And we'll display this again uh, in the middle of the meeting as well. Very good. So uh, with that, uh, I am happy to introduce one of my close friends and colleagues and a very distinguished uh, physician scientist, uh, Dr. Farooq uh, Zafar. Um, welcome, Farooq. Uh, we are so delighted that you're coming here today uh, as a grand round speaker. Uh, Farooq and my relationship uh, began in Jack Imaging when he was uh, an associate editor uh, specifically for looking at intracoronary uh, imaging. And I just re recognized uh, the amount of wealth of knowledge that he had in this field. Uh, and he has had an illustrious uh, career. He graduated from Stanford University uh, with a BS in mathematics and computer sciences and subsequently had MD and PhD in biophysics from University of Pennsylvania uh, and medicine in 1996. He completed then a residency and fellowship uh, in Brigham and Women Hospital, uh, followed by uh, interventional cardiac fellowship at Mass General Hospital. And subsequently in 2003, he joined the cardiology division as a faculty. He's currently the Associate Professor of Medicine at Harvard Medical School. Uh, and he is the Director of Coronary Intervention Program. He also directs the Chronic Total Occlusion uh, also the director of the high-risk PCI program at Mass General Hospital. And he also serves as the program director for the complex high-risk high risk PCI fellowship program. 50% of his time uh, is spent in basic science uh, investigation. 40% he takes care in clinical role for his complex coronary uh, care uh, in his ambulatory practice and interventional cardiology practice. And 10% teaching and medical education and and, and some time also in administration. He has an illustrious role in uh, several national and international society. He has been as an editorial board member and reviewer for several prestigious journals. Uh, and uh, he has been a principal investigation investigator at the MGH Cardiovascular Research Center, which has been continuously NIH funded till date. His uh, translational investigations are focused on atherosclerosis and thrombosis. And he has specifically focused on molecular imaging studies um, for biological processes for uh, several aspects of atherothrombosis, including inflammation, angiogenesis, and coagulation. Uh, he has uh, distinguished mentorship roles. And in 2013, he was the recipient of the Sky, uh, Sky Emerging Leadership uh, Mentorship um, Program. Um, and in addition to that, in 2015, he, he had the Siegman Prize for MD Mentorship from Harvard Medical School Health Sciences and Technology Program. He has 13 patents. He has 250 plus publications, 26 chapters, 22 editorials. And really he sh he's a, a role model for anyone who's wanting to go into uh, an academic uh, medicine, particularly in coronary uh, programs. So with that note, Farouk is going to uh, present his grand rounds and take us uh, on role on inflammation in coronary atherosclerosis. Farouk, the stage is yours. 
Arthur, thank you so much. That is such a kind introduction. It's it's really great to connect again. And thank you for the invitation and to your colleagues as well. I'm delighted to be here and look forward to um, sharing this. Um, only one clarification with that amazing record of my background. I didn't recognize it for a second, but uh, I usually describe my split as 80-80 to kind of describe what's going on in both dimensions. So <laughs> there you go. But um, this is, um, it's great. I'm so glad to be here and to speak to you about an area that is really, um, I think, important um, to understand how we're going to better phenotype and predict risk in our uh, complex coronary disease population or secondary disease uh, uh, prevention uh, patient uh, categories. So this talk is entitled Imaging Coronary Inflammation in the Cardiac Catheterization Laboratory, The Next Frontier. These are my disclosures. And so, you know, this foundation for this work is really, um, you know, underlying, underscored by the fact that we cannot precisely predict acute myocardial infarction in a way that's actionable that would allow us to do something differently than just aggressive secondary medical prevention um, with standard guidelines. And so while we have great technology that's really evolved in the last 20 years, um, 30 years for IVIS. Um, we also have OCT, high resolution, and IR spectroscopy, which looks at limit, lipid. Our ability to predict acute coronary syndromes, uh, plaque progression has really been limited to a positive predictive value of 20 to possibly 40%. And when one is at that level of prediction, it is hard to offer any form of interventional therapy or even more precise, aggressive secondary medical therapy. Um, now, unfortunately, a lot of these trials are limited by three-year endpoints to four-year endpoints, and we know that this process can affect patients over many decades. So we do have a shorter-term horizon than necessary. I think if you told a patient that they had a 50% chance of having a heart attack in seven years versus a 20% chance in three years, they, they would feel very differently about um, whether or not intervention would make sense to them. So there's some limits to this, but the bottom line is, is currently our structural-based imaging approaches are not good enough to predict it. So what's molecular imaging? This is really an approach I'm certainly sure many of you have heard this term. Um, it was really characterized about you know 25 years ago now. Um, the field really stems from even many decades older than that. You know, 50 years ago, um, radio-labeled monoclonal antibodies were being injected for nuclear spec-based imaging um, and uh, non-planar imaging. Uh, but then the field really started to approach high-resolution technologies like MRI and, and optical imaging and focus on PET rather than SPECT. And so a lot of investment happened in developing imaging agents. But for the coronary arteries, it's one of the hardest uh, targets to image. And um, that's because of its deep residence within the body, as well as blood flow and cardiac and respiratory motion. So to do this, if we're really going to try to do molecular imaging in coronaries, we need to think about sensitive imaging agents, as well as an appropriate device that would allow us to read out on the deposition of those imaging agents. So why are we interested in trying to do a better job in prediction in a cath lab? Certainly we want to absolutely predict that first event, but you know that's actually a higher target than actually trying to predict secondary coronary disease event rates. You know, I think we become somewhat immune to the benefits of secondary CAD prevention. We don't really use a lot of individualized titration in cancer. We sequence those cancers. We understand the exact drugs that we would need to optimally treat them in many cases. But in coronary disease, everyone has an LDL target of 70. If you're lucky, you'll find cardiologists who will say under 55 to 40. And um, we kind of just stop at that. Um, really, for that, we, of course, embrace lifestyle changes and other preventative aspects of diet. But we don't really um, focus on the fact that there's this underlying volcano. So despite kind of our best medical therapy, this is a nice review from Keith Fox in 2020. Um, we have four-year event rates that are 15%, and you know, this is 3 to 4% per year. This is really probably for life. And so if you look at someone who's young in their 50s or 60s, you know, the chance of them having a significant recurrence by the time they're 80 is probably well over 50% if you do the math. 
And so are we going to be settling for this? Could we do better? So let's talk about inflammation. Um, and, you know, I think we've recognized that this is a major driver from basic science for many decades. Um, but in the and in, in the late 2000s, the late 1990s and early 2000s, Paul Ridker um, showed some really important associations with IL-6 and HSCRP that got our our interest um, peaked. Uh, but we kind of said, well, it's inflammation, and you know, it really wasn't in the aggressive statin therapy era. So. What about now? What happens if you still have residual inflammation, even when you have a optimal LDL of under 70%? And this was one study published in Jack about four years ago now that showed that the instance rates um, are nearly twofold if there is persistently high residual inflammation, in this case defined by an HSCRP greater than two. And uh, inflammation is, is actually probably more important than an LDL in this particular subgroup. And more recently, another inflammatory marker, cathepsin S. Cathepsin is a cysteine protease that's elastolytic and collagenolytic. It helps models expand and it can destabilize fibrous caps. This showed, out, showed that after a non-STEMI, the blood cathepsin S level was predictive. The higher that it was, was the higher the event raised. And this was not just recurrent events, this is all caused death. And so here we have another inflammatory biomarker. Now this is based in the blood. So one would say, well, gosh, if I could actually start to image these aspects within plaques themselves, this is where the events happen, might I actually start to do a better job at understanding future risk? So again, just to kind of frame what's happened in the current state of intravascular imaging, um, this is a nice summary of, of the different targets within the plaque, structural and molecular. And again, because we used structural-based techniques like IVIS and OCT, these aspects have gained kind of the greatest prominence that we think about. For example, a thin fibrous cap or necrotic cores, um, possibly intraplaque hemorrhage. Inflammation, which you see down here on that kind of bottom right, is something that is starting to emerge as a possibility with um, fluorescence-based techniques. And that's really been the focus of our lab for the last 17 years. And so I'll talk about that um, um, next uh, very shortly, but just to kind of again frame the importance of, of why we're interested in imaging inflammation within atherosclerosis, um, really a rich foundation for why, um, and really all aspects, uh, multiple cells conspire to secrete inflammatory mediators that can really lead to plaque rupture, or in certain cases, plaque erosion now increasingly, neutrophil driven process, endothelial disclamation. Um, but when we are able to image aspects of biology, including inflammation, um, we're potentially in a position to see things that we've never seen before. So no question that we can look at high-risk plaques um, when we start to get inflammation involved. And I'll show you some data about how inflammation predicts plaque progression independent of bulk. Um, but there are other things. What about coronary allograft vasculopathy? Um, you know, late coronary disease um, is the biggest cause of transplant failure. Um, we don't really adjust um, anti-inflammatories or immunosuppressives based on the biology of the coronary arteries. And we know that routine IVIS or an OCT doesn't really do things, but we're not able to image the biology. So if we're starting to see T cell infiltration and inflammation, there might be opportunities. SCAD, really interesting, the idea of detecting intraplaque hemorrhage and residual inflammation after SCAD, um, that might have some implications for healing. Stent complications, we've looked at fibrin deposition, neoatherosclerosis now healing, these are possibly, and then in the short term, we might also have an important an application to do a better job with PCI guidance. For example, geographic miss, sometimes it's hard to tell with, of course, angiography, but even with IVIS. Um, so we have techniques that can label denuded endothelium in the vessel wall after injury, it might help us to do a better job of avoiding geographic miss or improve the detection of dissection, which is sometimes harder to do by IVIS, certainly than OCT. And then of course, for new drugs and new devices, um, this is a wonderful opportunity to test the anti-inflammatory effects. So um, why have we embraced fluorescence imaging? So NERF or near-infrared fluorescence molecular imaging, this is an optical-based approach to image um, fluorescent sensors that have been injected intravenously and then deposit in plaques or stents. 
And many years ago, we became interested in optical imaging because it was really emerging into the cath lab really through OCT and then near uh, NIRS. And that's because light can flexibly uh, can be um, transmitted down flexible fibers into coronary arteries at low profile. We became interested in fluorescence, but the NIR window in for fluorescence, which is typically defined at 650 to 900 nanometers. And that's because when we, if we're injecting an imaging agent and it's lodged in a plaque, we need to be able to detect that fluorescent imaging agent above the background due to autofluorescence and also sometimes in the presence of blood, which is highly attenuating in the visible light range. So in the NIR window, autofluorescence and blood attenuation drops by orders of magnitude, allowing us to detect fluorescence much more sensitively. And then the third component to this was really um, recognizing the potential for clinical near infrared fluorescence molecular imaging agents to emerge. We'll talk about endocyanine green as well as ProSense BM 110, which is a cathepsin imaging activity reporter. Many imaging agents are evolving from cancer and they have a cross biology with coronary disease. So we're actually very interested in repurposing some of these. Uh, for those who follow the surgical oncology literature, fluorescence-based imaging is used in the operating room in clinical trials right now to do a better job of detecting tumor edges um, and margins. And some of these um, imaging agents, um, again, can be repurposed for uh, atherosclerosis. So again, you might be wondering, well, how would I actually use this um, technology? It seems kind of cool, but are we really gonna be imaging patients invasively to understand risk? So our, our focus on doing this is to really incorporate it in a practical environment. And that is really as part of coronary intervention, which is our highest risk secondary CAD population. Those who are going into invasive procedures. So PCI is performed a million times a year and increasingly um, IVIS and OCT guidance is being used. So if we have the ability to couple fluorescence with IVIS or OCT, we could use this technology kind of in the standard workflow at the time that we're doing stent expansion um, assessment. Um, we could also inject our fluorescence imaging agent and do a pullback to understand the fluorescence landscape of the areas in the stent and proximal and distal to the stent. So because this area is growing, we think there's a lot of potential to embrace multimodal imaging as part of our structural imaging approach to allow us to do um, really standard workflow and better understand the coronary arteries in their inflammatory state. And so, um, as we talked about this before, um, you know, the, why, why would an inflammation be really helpful to us as clinicians? Um, if I tell someone their event rate is twofold that of the average patient, even though they're LDL 60, they're gonna be very interested as we will as clinicians at trying to help their rates drop further. So understanding how to do targeted drug prescription based on the biology and event rate risk, I think is really important. We had X amount of dollars, we really wanna spend it on drugs that are gonna be targeted to the highest risk patients. So here's a way to potentially do that. Um, same thing for restenosis, which is still a major limitation to successful long-term intervention. Um, the underlying vessel wall can probably predict to some degree what the restenosis event rates will be. And then for stent healing, um, there's also this uh, very, very interesting area of shortened DAP versus long-term DAP. How do we decide? And then ultimately for other um, um, new drugs and new devices, we can start to look at these um, as predictive models. So I'm gonna talk about um, the engineering side just for a brief moment. This is a fluorescence, near-infrared fluorescence OCT molecular imaging system. This was designed by my partner, Gary Tierney, who's really one of the worldwide founders of coronary OCT. Um, first case was done at MGH in 2002 with his system. We collaborated in the late 2000s to talk about incorporating fluorescence into an OCT-based system because they're both light-based. And this was the first uh, system that was published demonstrating the ability to detect both fluorescence and OCT backscatter in a single catheter that was specially made to carry both signals. In addition to OCT coupling, there has been the ability to couple this with IVIS. And um, initially a side-by-side -side design has been refined into now something that's similar to a standard IVIS catheter, 3.2 French, which has an ultrasound transducer and optical uh, fiber here for aperture to be able to detect fluorescence in simultaneously with IVIS. 
And um, you know, both are important, both IVUS and OCT are critically important to the imaging world. So having fluorescence for both of these is a, an important um, uh, addition. When we kind of look at this um, as kind of a scope of what we're doing, um, this is a, a, one of our first um, 2D intravascular um, pullbacks. Um, and you can see it's actually surface shaded. Those are plaques in a rabbit aorta, which is the size of a human coronary. And you can see that the levels of orange are more intense. And that's actually reflecting the amount of protease activity, cathepsin protease activity inflammation. And, you know, if we looked at these without the color map, they would just look like little blobs of gray. But there's obviously a heterogeneity of this. And um, it really begs the question of whether or not more inflamed plaques are more likely to progress. We really don't actually know that is true in patients in the coronaries. We have some sense of that in larger arteries through PET, um, but we don't know about that in the coronaries. And so the beauty of fluorescence is that we can co-localize our imaging agent with fluorescent markers. These are for macrophages, this is cathepsin B. We can see fibrin on stents. If you looked at the 2D image alone for IVUS long view, impossible to really see if there's fibrin that's microscopic here. The fluorescent label for fibrin is lighting it up. So this is an unhealed stent um, that's far easier to see by fluorescence-based techniques. Um, we can do this in the coronaries as well. More recently, the streamlined device was um, done in, a, in our um, uh, model of pig coronary atheroma, injected with a cathepsin imaging agent. And here, even though there's very mild atheroma here in this bottom, there is a strong fluorescent signal indicating um, uh, protease activation and inflammation here. So in a coronary artery with a small catheter. So this, and so of course we're not clinical yet, um, although we are um, going to uh, be ready to do clinical studies next year in a first in human clinical trial, which I'll talk about. Um, we have done a substantial amount of work in um, rapid atherosclerosis in the aorta, which is the size of a human coronary. So this work was carried on by Eric Osborne and Johan Verhans, looking at the effects of plaque progression based on the initial inflammatory response. Um, and the, the initial plaque burden response. So baseline imaging in a atherosclerotic model at, at eight weeks, and then four weeks later, repeat imaging. And what was found was really quite interesting. So the, the upper left are the 2D fluorescent maps. This is an inflammation map. These aortas are uh, Fogarty balloon injured, and then high rabbits are cholesterol fed. So this is why there's a regional increase. Here you can see higher inflammation. This area, um, showed after four weeks that there was progressive progression of inflammation. And we looked at what was happening in the IVUS mass for plaque burden. Um, we started to see this really interesting relationship that the fluorescence baseline signal would help predict what the change in plaque progression was. And this is shown more graphically in example here um, where fluorescence OCT is um, used to define the inflammation signal. This is a very mild plaque. 12.5% um, plaque burden at baseline. Here's the inflammation signal here, cathepsin protease activity. Here's what happens at 12 weeks is this plaque progresses from 12.5% to 34% plaque burden. And it really is progressing in the areas where there is inflammation um, here and here, for example. Really, um, you know, that, this has never really been shown before that regional prediction, even within a single frame is possible based on the inflammatory response. Now, when we looked at the baseline fluorescence inflammation signal at the change in percent atheroma volume, it was very strongly correlated with an R value of 0.7. So, um, and after adjustment, still significant at 0.35, even when we adjust for plaque burden at baseline, minimal luminal diameter. So this is really, you know, I think demonstrating that inflammation itself could have some addictive, add additional predictive value maybe getting our present predictive values up to 50% to 60% at three years might change the way that we think about enrolling people in interventional trials and happy to chat about that. So I'd like to show just a couple other applications of why inflammation imaging might be useful. This is um, a story about drug coated balloons, which um, are, you know I, I know our audience knows uh, that this was, has been such a, a controversial field in the last five years. 
Um, historically, DCBs were used as the standard in the US for endovascular therapy. Um, they were kind of class one indicated and um, uh, were indicated for FEMPOP disease. And this was all part of every a AUC guideline. But uh, in late 2018, the Katsanos meta-analysis, um, which was not patient specific, patient level, uh, demonstrated that there was an increase in the DCB arm in the two year and five year mortality um, when a meta-analysis was performed. And it was, it was substantial, the point estimates here being 1.8 and 1.6. And so, um, and this, this carried out to five years for those small trials that ended up carrying it out. So this, of course, you know, led to the you know, classic firestorm that we had, similar to what we had when drug eluding stents were a question in the late in the mid 2000s for um, having increased mortality. As a result of this, um, DCB uh, use dropped dramatically from 2019 onward, and while it's still picking upward, there's still a black box label from the US FDA saying that. Um, currently, until there's more data, there's the chance that drug-coated balloons could actually be associated with increased mortality. Now, um, because of this, they were very interested in, um, you know, kind of making sure a decision for using DCBs was um, individually discussed with patients. Um, but in addition, they recommended that, um, that there was a substantial a need for studies to better understand the mechanism. What is there really a late mortality increase? And, um, you know, they recommended the potential for animal studies also to understand um, what is happening to the artery wall when paclitaxel is deposited into it, especially atherosclerosis. And believe it or not, really most of this work in, has been done with restenosis models, uh, but not actually on atherosclerosis. And that was important because of this potential for higher heart attack rate and cardiovascular death. So we asked the question of what are the effects of, of DCBs actually on experimental atherosclerosis? Compared to a regular balloon or a sham balloon, how does this affect atheromal progression and inflammation? And so um, uh, what we did is we applied our, our standard balloon atherosclerosis hyperlipidemic rabbit uh, model of um, of atherosclerosis in the aorta, and then randomized rabbits at um, week six into DCB, standard PT, uh, PTCA, PTA balloon, or sham, where we just took a balloon, did not blow it up and took it out. And then we measured what happened to the plaque burden by IVIS and the plaque inflammation by fluorescence, nerf OCT, and prosets. What we found was really pretty dramatic. So in the DCB arm, there was some mild increase in inflammation from the six to 10 week mark in this area. This is a 40 millimeter Admiral 4.0 by 40 balloon. Um, and uh, on the flip side, on the IVIS side, there was really no progression of atherosclerosis and in some cases even regression. Contrast that with standard balloon angioplasty where there was substantial development of inflammation and plaque progression, and compared to the sham arm, that where there was even more inflammation and even greater plaque progression. We put these out quantitatively and looked at the um, event rates for. You guys see that? Okay, there we go. Um, Let's see if it stays. Okay. Oh, sorry. I'll go back into presentation mode. Had a little stall. Okay. I think I'm back on track. So what we found is that the, the in the PAV come back here time. So in the DCB arm, and I think the title is here. This is the DCB arm. But basically, the DCB arm markedly reduced the total atheroma volume change, the percent atheroma volume change and preserved MLA greater than standard angioplasty or um, uh, no angioplasty. Inflammation um, trended significantly lower uh, by intravascular nerve imaging and was lower on uh, microscopic analyses. And this happened with um, no differences amongst cholesterol change or CRP levels. And so we looked at the biology and was trying to understand what was happening. And we found that 
um, DCB uh, based angioplasty, markedly reduced plaque and macrophages, markedly reduced plaque smooth muscle cells. And when we image the, and when we analyze the um, resected plaques by RNA, there were substantial decreases in cathepsins uh, measured by transcripts, measured by RNA, and in vitro looking at um, uh, uh, 264 macrophages, um, raw 264.7 cells, there was a decrease in cathepsin strips cathepsin transcripts that were dose dependent based on paclitaxel. So this really gave us the sense that um, paclitaxel drug coated balloons are suppressing plaque inflammation and potentially inducing plaque regression as compared to PTA or sham PTA. And this was really the first evidence that we had that, that you know, drug coated balloons are actually doing something very salutary for your arterial wall. And this is, um, you know, kind of reassuring preclinical evidence and of course, in parallel, we've had a number of patient level meta-analysis showing that there is no um, worsened mortality signal, but this animal data provides some evidence that um, molecular imaging can really be important in understanding device mechanism. Also from a pure kind of broader standpoint with DCBs entering the market next year for the coronaries, we hope, um, this really gives one the uh, concept that like maybe just more liberal application of DCBs might actually be a vulnerable plaque strategy we're thinking about. I'm happy to talk about two in that discussion. In the last um, uh, few moments, I will um, talk about um, how do we get imaging agents into the clinic? Um, because while ProSense VM110 is fantastic, it's only been injected into one patient. There are other cathepsin imaging agents that are coming and I'll speak about that at the end. But one of the most attractive imaging agents that we came across was indocyanine green. And ICG is probably known to most people um, because it's been around for uh, maybe about 50 years. It's an NIR 404. So in the 800 range, which is where, of course, we're interested in doing molecular imaging work with fluorescence. It turns out it binds lipid, HDL, and LDL, where that became of interest to us, of course, with atherosclerosis, accumulates in sites of inflammation, fantastic. And it's FDA approved since 1970 for retinal imaging, which is done as an outpatient every day in the U.S. So we said, well, boy, you know, it looks like it's got a lot of favorable targeting features for atherosclerosis. Could this actually bind um, plaques? Could it actually serve as an atherosclerosis targeting imaging agent? And so um, at that stage, this was in the mid 2000s, the late 2000s, our first generation's fluorescence catheter was a simple wire. And what we found is that in this balloon model, after we uh, balloon injured aorta, when we pulled the wire back after ICG injection, we found a very strong signal emanating at plaques within 15 to 20 minutes after detection. And when we took this out and we found there was durable signal at 45 minutes and it was co-localizing with lipid as well as macrophages. And this was really, really surprising because ICG had been around for 40 years and no one had really thought it could be atherosclerosis targeting. And so uh, we became very interested in understanding why that was. We did some additional mechanistic work and showed that ICG could bind foam cells. This was collaborative with Peter Libby, um, showing that foam cells that were loaded uh, uh, with lip, macrophages that were loaded with lipid to become foam cells could robustly take up ICG, as well as um, even non-foam um, cells, macrophages that were stimulated could also take up ICG. So we said, okay, that was really cool. And we showed ex vivo that it could bind human specimens, but is it actually useful for clinical imaging? If we inject it intravenously, is it actually gonna bind atherosclerosis? And so this was a study um, also carried out by Johan and Eric uh, to do a first in human study of looking at ICG for targeted imaging. This was done at MGH in eight patients. Five got, were injected with ICG using the standard dose for retinal outpatient imaging and three controls. So up to 25 milligrams. Um, and we'd gone over to Mass Eye and Ear to kind of check it out. And really these patients were just um, getting these outpatient and then walking out. Plaques were resected about 99 minutes after surgery. And then we performed ex vivo imaging um, and uh, detailed histological evaluation. And what we found is that all five out of five subjects uh, took up ICG in their carotids. You can see here, um, internal carotid with intraplaque hemorrhage, right at the bifurcation is where ICG uptake was. And 
um, it was a really interesting histological experiment because this huge plaque is full of lipid and macrophages. But yet what we were finding is that there was very focused spots of ICG uptake. For example, here at this binding, this is actually the lumen, and this is the huge plaque. And um, what we found was that in areas that ICG was taking up, it was really access to the blood. And so we saw, for example, here in this area that was positive, lots of macrophages in the area, but more importantly, the endothelium was absent. So ICG could bathe this area. We also found it deeper in plaques and intraplaque hemorrhage area where the vasovasorum were leaky. So ICG needed to leak and then bind. So in some ways, it's really more than just a lipid or, or macrophage binder. It's really a function of endothelial barrier impairment. And then once it leaks, it's able to find suitable binding targets. Here is an example of intraplaque hemorrhage. So here's the lumen, but deeper in the plaque, we saw ICG uptake. And when we investigated here, this is carstair stain for fibrin, ICG showing up right in this area. We're not exactly sure what it binds within thrombosis. CD31, lots of neovessels here in this area where there is leaky vasculature, and that's probably why ICG is able to get in here and bind it. So um, um, really interesting. We learned something very different by doing the human study as opposed to the mouse study. It's a rabbit study. That's really based on the size of the plaques are very, very different. It's 5,000 microns versus 200 microns in terms of their thickness. Um, we've also been able to show, as well as um, our, uh, another group um, who are former postdoctoral fellows, that one can use ICG to bind coronary atheroma. This was a pig study um, demonstrating, again, that ICG could leak into um, uh, plaques that were created with in pigs that had diabetes. Another model here um, showing that ICG in a pig model was also detectable. So ICG looks promising. Um, so that was great that we had this clinical uh, potential imaging agent that we could inject, and we are very interested in using ICG to kind of advance this field. But before we went into this, we also had to prove to ourselves that we could actually do intracoronary imaging with a fluorescence based catheter. And so this was um, our first in human study that uh, Gary and I led the development on. This was done with um, using a NIR catheter that was tuned to 630 nanometers rather than 750. And this was to allow us to detect, detect black autofluorescence in the near infrared. And again, just to clarify, when we inject imaging agents, we want them to be further red where there's less autofluorescence. But in order to actually demonstrate that a combined fluorescence catheter could be useful, without injecting an imaging agent, which would have added another complexity level, we changed the fluorescent wavelength to 633, where autofluorescence is more prominent. And so we imaged 12 cath lab patients. This is now about um, seven years ago, um, where we were doing the imaging in 2016 and 17. Um, this, the reason we got interested in autofluorescence is some of the ex vivo work and aortic specimens showed that um, looks like there was autofluorescence in necrotic cores. So we said, okay, let's do this in patients. And um, this was uh, one of the sample results from an LED intervention, very focal autofluorescence here on the 2D pullback, no imaging agent, this is just autofluorescence. And we found that when we looked at this more carefully that um, we were starting to see autofluorescence co-localizing in areas of large lipid plaques, um, less so in calcification. This was a TICFA by OCT phenotyping, and there was some calcium here as well. You can see these little bright spots on the ring, and this is all distance corrected and um, kind of a real-time pullback. So what is causing autofluorescence? Um, it turned out another group um, in Australia, um, Carl Heinz Peter and his colleagues, I became interested in this area and actually had a very nice study demonstrating that intraplaque hemorrhage can generate products that are out of fluorescent, and specifically bilirubin and protoporphyrin 9, which are in the heme degradation pathway. And they were able to show this intraplaque hemorrhage could actually cause, uh, be associated with near infrared autofluorescence. They show that here when they stained for bilirubin and looked at the overlap with NIR autofluorescence. We thought that was really interesting, but we had some additional insights ourselves as we were starting to look at this. Um, when we looked at these plaques more carefully, we started to sense that there was also 
potential to see autofluorescence in the NIR that was different than intraplaque, less prevalent in coronary plaques, and we definitely see an uh, NIRAF in coronary plaques. So what could be the source of intraplaque, uh, of NIRAF beyond intraplaque hemorrhage? So this led us to a study looking at carotids and systematically assessing both lipid and intraplaque hemorrhage. So intraplaque hemorrhage being assessed by glycophorin A and lipid being assessed by pseudon black, which also stains neutral lipids and triglycerides. What we found is that the NIRAF was starting to co-localize, really correlate with both of these, both for pseudon black lipid and for glycophorin A intraplaque hemorrhage. We drilled down this, drilled down on this a little bit more, and you can see areas here starting to show that NIRAF was really co-localizing. And you know, my general sense of this is the punctate brighter zones were actually co-localizing more with lipid than with hemorrhage. We also found that there was oxidative stress in these areas here, where, and this was detected by Prussian blue and DAB staining to enhance oxidative stress. These also showed co-localization with macrophages. So this is really, these are things that are lipid-mediated, lipid-driven oxidation, macrophage-based. So we said, well, can we actually generate NIRAP in vitro? And could lipid actually generate NIRAP? And so using um, human uh, monocyte-derived macrophages, um, we uh, demonstrated that oxidized LDL and hemoglobin could both generate NIRAP, quantified this by flow cytometry. And we found that oxidized LDL was really potent at generating um, this much more than, than LDL, um, that the NIRAP signal was much higher and could quantify this. Um, and that you didn't have to have intraplaque hemorrhage around, um, which is simulated here by hemoglobin, in order to get NIRAF. You could do it strictly with lipid alone. And that when oxidized LDL was present, there was also the demonstration of oxidative stress as measured by a cell rocks reagent. And we showed so subsequently that you could also suppress this with antioxidant therapy like an acetylcysteine or vitamin E. Um, as shown here. So we're able to really suppress the development of NIRAF, which has been um, really interesting. This turns out to be really related to steroid, this lipid, the brightest form of, of NIRAF co-localizes to insoluble lipid or steroid, which is this lipid protein conglomerate. And so um, I'll, uh, I'll summarize by uh, concluding our work in, in near infrared fluorescence molecular imaging. It's a new translatable approach. It allows us to predict experimentally plaque progression, demonstrate the anti-inflammatory uh, actions of paclitaxel-based drug balloons and other devices. We also have abstracts showing that this technology can be used to detect changes in anti-inflammatory states, for example, with GLP-1 receptor agonists and icosapen ethyl. ICG is a translatable nerve agent that's already FDA approved that, that does bind lipid and macrophages, but really through an endothelial-based mechanism. And the nice thing about that is, is because it's already readily available, once a catheter is approved, which is expected within the next several years, that we'll have an imaging agent ready to go with that that could have some clinical utility. And you know, we're delighted to report that the NIH has, has been interested in this area and they have funded a first in human study using a different agent to image protease activity um, that's gonna be produced by a LUMA cell called LUM015. This is planned for um, second half of 2024. And this will be really the first demonstration that we can inject an imaging agent and then detect its presence as a function of cathepsin inflammatory protease activity. Prior to this, we still have an opportunity to understand the importance of NIRAF, near-infrared autofluorescence. This is label-free imaging of steroid and oxidative stress, intraplaque hemorrhage, um, in addition to a first-in-human study for um, fluorescence molecular imaging of inflammation. We are also planning a serial imaging study um, with NIRAF to understand itself if NIRAF, pure autofluorescence, does it predict plaque progression by um, uh, serial CT imaging. And so um, we'll conclude by um, stating that NERF imaging has the potential to improve CAD phenotyping and really facilitate personalized medical therapy. With that, I just wanna thank our collaborators, which are extensive. Um, in order to do this work, it does take a scientific village with engineering, radiology, chemistry, and biology. Um, we're blessed to have phenomenal collaborators in the course. Our fellows do all the hard work. Um, they are really a spectacular crew that 
is based across a wide variety of disciplines. And um, of course, our thanks to our funding agencies that continue to support this work. And with that, I'll close and happy to take any questions. Thank you, Farooq. That was an outstanding overview. I mean, um, uh, so it's so exciting that, um, you know, this is uh, getting translated so rapidly. Uh, so first of all, congratulations to you and your team for bringing some of this uh, into highlights. I'd like to bring my a group of uh, panelists, uh, Dr. Ashok Chaudhry um, and also Dr. Ramzan Zakir um, will join us in the panelists. And, and I'm sure that they have several questions to be asked. But one thing that is... Um, uh, I've been wondering to ask you is um, for for the several patients uh, who experience uh, coronary events um, and don't have um, uh, essentially um, or, or they have don't have significant plaques. So, do you think the inflammation uh, somehow alters the? blood flow rheology or what you experience, for example, when you see a slow flow, low flow, um, how does that uh, correlate with the state of inflammate, inflammation? Is, is there any such relationship in those uh, scenarios? Yeah, I think that's a great question. In, in acute MI, there's no question that's a massive inflammatory response um, in the setting of acute MI. And there's actually some great um, experimental evidence um, in a nature paper from one of my colleagues, Matthias Narendorf, who showed that if you create a heart attack in a mouse, you accelerate atherosclerosis in the next several weeks to months. And so that pro-inflammatory state is actually pro-atherogenic, which is probably why the complete trial was successful is that's because there is a highly pro-stimulating environment after acute MI. So preventing it, those are plaques more likely to progress. As far as the slow flow phenomenon, when there's diffuse microvascular disease in the setting of post-MI, that's a, that's a complex environment that definitely inflammation plays a role of, as well as you know, thrombosis plugging. Mm -hmm. uh, no question that anytime there is slow flow, this is bad for one's coronaries and pro-atherogenic and pro-stent thrombosis. Um, how to fix that acutely is unknown, um, but if persistent snow flow exists, uh, I do think it is really a curious um, question about whether or not, for example, in microvascular disease, refractory microvascular angina, um, if these patients actually have epicardial abnormalities as well. I don't think we really know that yet. So, when, uh, so, uh, so if you were to dissect the difference. So one of the understanding that I have is a microvascular disease could be endothelial dysfunction, could be um, all the debris that are going downstream and plugging yeah. the circulatory. I, but how much of that mm -hmm. stuff flow could just be innately related to the inflammation? Is there a vasomotion or is there an inherent relationship with the amount of flux that travels through the coronary artery and the state of the inflammation in the wall? Is there a relationship between that? independent of the microvascular circulatory state? I think it's a great, I think it's unknown. I think it's a great question. I think it will be definitely imminently testable, for example, through endothelial dependent and independent flow-based mechanisms that we're doing in you know, microvascular assessments with both adenosine and acetylcholine. So one could phenotype the coronary inflammatory state and then understand what the capacity is. For example, what is our CFR under low inflammation, high inflammation? conditions, what's our vasodilatation capacity or vasoconstriction response as a function of inflammation in the wall. These are things that we will be able to study, uh, but I think are still unknown. I think it's a great question of, um, you know, how inflammation is going to affect those parameters. And I'll, I'll ask you later, but maybe have the panelists ask some more questions. This is so, so fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, thank you very much for this uh, very exciting um uh, work that you're doing. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have the near infrared uh, the nurse imaging or fluoroscopy imaging in our lab. We do have IVUS and OCT. Uh, I'll tell you a story of a patient that we just had. And I'm just thinking uh, out loud and maybe uh, you can uh, give some insights. So I had a patient who had a non-obstructive CAD just a couple of months ago based on cath. He had a um, uh, very typical chest pain and was sent home on, on a stat and his LDL was like 100. And within two months, he came with a massive anterior wall MI. Uh, 
Um, and, and the reason was we had access to the angiograms just a couple of months prior from a different hospital we looked at it and it was truly non-obstructive. It was like 20% lesion at the most. And within two months, it comes with a massive MI and we, we put a stent and, and I'm just thinking, you know, if we were to do that angiogram the first place round, I mean, I'm sure a lot of us in a, in a practical sense, uh, we would not even be doing a FFR for a 20% lesion. We're not necessarily be doing an IVUS or OCT. Uh, but I guess, you know, if you're doing a CT, coronary CT on this patient, we would be able to look at inflammation. There are a lot of, you know, uh, fat inflammation things. But despite all of that, uh, uh, is there anything at this point we're going to do differently? Of course, we, we can do a statin, we can do PCSK9. Uh, this your concept of using a DCB, it looks promising down the line, or maybe a scaffold uh, that absorbs. Uh, but but what do we do with all, all this clinical information? Even if we were to do a in your lab, if you do OCT and you see a vulnerable plaque, what do you do differently uh, for these patients? I mean, it's just a knowledge is powerful, but what do you do with this knowledge? Uh, it's kind of a dilemma. I'm sure it's a it's a great question, and it's a very much a you know question for uh, the whole field of high risk plaque imaging that is constantly po posited. Um, first thing is the anecdote is really, you know really terrible, and um, you know I'd love to someday review that angiogram in a blinded way to um, understand because um, it's pretty rare to go from 20% to a STEMI unless there's a thromboemboli or severe spasm on top of that. So um, on the other hand, like, you know, it's possible if you had a massive plaque burden that, you know, it just positive remodel and it was unfortunate to have a rupture erosion and severe thrombosis. But as you guys, of course, know, when we aspirate most thrombi off of plaques, we usually have severe lesions. So it's not like a 30% lesion that is there at the time in the cath lab. Most of that is not thrombus. Most of it is plaque. So there's stepwise gradations of how plaques grow. Um, and we may miss, you know, that's one of the sampling biases in this vulnerable plaque hypothesis. People say non-stomatic plaques don't cause heart attacks. Uh, I mean, they're the ones that cause heart attacks, right? But they get to serial stenosis levels below the radar that we can't track because we're not constantly imaging. Um, as far as what we would do, I mean, at the end of the day, like there's two things that we need to do. One is, is that if we tell someone that they have an event rate that's twofold above normal, we're going to look at those people differently. Right now, we can't do that. In cath lab, you come in for your primary PCI or ACS, you'll have a stent, you'll go home with a standard garden variety, let's get your LDL to 70, get your blood pressure controlled, get your A1C control. That That is just insufficient. And we, we should not be settling for recurrent event rates to be like, oh, yeah, I wish I would have made your statin a little more intense then, or maybe I should have added Zeti at that time. And I think we're just, we don't know. And, you know, all the inflammation slides show that even with optimal LDLs, residual inflammation makes a difference. So I think um, hopefully we can do a better job than just a blood biomarker for understanding inflammation, which is, you know, my, my biggest concern is that people think a single blood value is as useful as an image inside the coronary arteries. And um, I think as long as we can get that information pretty seamlessly and simultaneously, um, people will start to figure out what to do. Um, as far as local therapies, we also know that if we're going to randomize people in preventative PCI trials, that won't we want to find the patients at the highest event rates, those who have two or three times the event rate. So targeted trial selection is another really neat opportunity for this type of information. You do your diagnostic angiogram. I think CT is going to play a great role in this for kind of diffuse plaque burden and non-calcified plaque burden. But um, if we also get another point of care in the cath lab um, measure that says the event rate's high. Those are the people I'll be like, sign me up for these randomized trials. So Farouk, can I ask a provocative, provocative question? So I'm usually not doing the coronary angiograms myself, but what if this patient who had a 20, 30 percent lesion, but let's say it was focally very positively remodeled and the amount of the total amount of the plaque burden versus the luminogram, what is showing. Luminogram is showing it's 20, 30%, but if, if it is focally, and your actual measurement of the vessel size is much different by imaging, then it may be a much more larger stenosis than we are looking at and we are missing it. And he could have advocated for uh, stenting at that point. Sure. I mean, if we if we had pathology, we'd say that's a 60% stenosis. It's massively positively remodeled. 
so we can't see the boundary. We're using the boundary of the reference segments by luminography. You know, I think I would I would focus if we're really going to do this, I would focus on trying to find patients that have kind of multiple predictors of risk. So that is in addition to large plaque burden is a small MLA. I think that is really great. That's what the prospect absorbed trial used. And um, both of those parameters are super helpful. So that that would be my first one. And then I would add any kind of inflammation or leak signal beyond that to show that plaques are biologically active. And my prediction is, is like, once you get those parameters in place, that the event rates are going to be much higher than three or 15%, but closer to 30% to 40%. And then we're going to start to be really thinking about, hey, let's randomize and start to do preventative therapy um, with, you know, again, hopefully next generation bioresorbable scaffolds like Magmaris and things like that that are thinner and better or, or BCBs, right? If it's a soft non-calcified plaque, what a great opportunity to do a gentle angioplasty um, and not leave a permanent metal scaffold. So, Farouk, so, I mean, the study, you know, really got a lot of uh, interest and excitement with, uh, with Prospect and uh, Viva showing that, you know, identifying this necrotic core and this thick cap, um, you know, pyrethroma, you know, is associated with increased events. And then we saw the Glockoff study, and then we saw the... Uh, uh, the athro reno IVA study and stuff, which, you know, showed that it really didn't correlate. And then that it was more about this plaque burden, which kind of what Partho mentioned and kind of went back to the basics that, you know, just, you know, um, and then there was, I think there was a drug even trying to target, you know, decreasing the cardiac core, which did that, but didn't translate to events. And so how do you reconcile, uh, you know, the first two studies, these two studies, and what Prospect 2 is going to look at and everything and the field limits on the whole? <clears throat> sure. Um, yeah, you summarized there are a lot of important trials, and that technology was really done with something called IVIS virtual histology. So VH, which is, you know, kind of something we used a lot, or an IMAP technique similar to that. Um, these kind of plaque compositional RF, they're kind of basically by analyzing the RF ultrasound wave to segment calcium or necrotic core. Um, it turns out that they were not that useful as parameters. And so the world kind of moved on for that and certainly recognized plaque burden, which is super easy and reliable, was the most useful thing that came out of the early IVA studies. Then the next phase is really, you know, the LRP study um, that demonstrated with NIR spectroscopy, which is NERS, which is different than what I've been speaking about, which is NIRF, NIR fluorescence. Um, nurse spectroscopy lipid also was additive to plaque burden, but not in a way that really gets your positive predictive uh, values up to 40, 50%. So we do not have technology yet that does that. There's really only one, but it's kind of fallen out, which was endothelial shear stress that Peter Stone did in the mid 2000s. Um, but that's computationally very uh, intense and you know, only a few centers in the world really do it. So we don't really have a technology yet that has been disruptive beyond plaque burden. Our hypothesis is that inflammation in biology is really going to be something that will do that. Great. It seems like uh, there will be per perhaps more opportunities to phenotype these plaques using the coronary CT uh, and then cross-correlated with the invasive um, uh, studies that we'll be doing. And I think the future is going to look into, um, it's it's looking very exciting because I think there'll be so many different routes you can take based upon some of these informations. Um, well, we, we are definitely interested in FAI. I mean, I, I think that, um, you know, the Oxford group has done a really good job, but it's not to me fully clear exactly what is being measured all the time. And it's obviously, as you know, it's a proprietary algorithm. So, and it's also really heavily dominated by the adventitia as opposed to the intima. So there's these things that are not clearly, you know, sensible to me yet. I mean, I think it could add predictive value and, you know, we're obviously um, following eagerly to see that. We love CT as a gatekeeper for any work we do in the cath lab, it's great. Um, I still would really focus on the secondary prevention population before I went to primary. And because we're gonna be in there doing invasive imaging, I kind of think this is really a natural one, but CT you know, might tip us off that if we're in a given artery, someone's LAD, 
and we're working on a zone that there could be substantial disease. And, um, you know, CT may have some new, you know, additive insights into that if it's available. And I see a lot of um, work, at least in the CD space, uh, they're looking at pericoronary adipose tissue and looking at markers of inflammation based upon that. And um, and I think Jim Men's group has been doing, clearly they have a company with clearly with, they're trying to do a lot of phenotyping of the plaques. Um, this is an onward journey um, to see the continuum of non-invasive to the invasive spectrum of uh, imaging. Uh, and then leading to specific therapies. So, very exciting. Great, uh, Farouk. Uh, thank you very much for uh, staying with us. And uh, and I'm sure that must have intrigued a lot of minds. And I'm going to, um, uh, you know, perhaps bring you back again in the future to see where the field goes. And uh, we continue to keep on learning. And uh, thank you very much uh, for being here with us today. Absolutely. My pleasure. Thanks so much, Partha. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Ashok. Rums. Thanks, Rose. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Take care. Bye-bye. All right. Bye-bye.